We have Prophet Ron Campbell with us, and uh, boy, we're looking forward to a powerful time tonight, and uh, our expectation is, Lord, what are you going to say? What are you going to speak to us? Uh, I know there are some things you have concerning uh, what God is saying about America. Yeah. I just want to ask some questions that uh, uh, for the audience, yeah. because, because we're gearing up for tonight. So. Yeah their expectations won't be false. Yes. And because, you know, sometimes people have some uh, some false expectations yeah. and they think that certain things that should be this way and you should tell them their age and <laughs> things of that nature. <laughs> but uh, let me ask you, what do you perceive based on scripture concerning prophecy, uh, prophet of the Old Testament and the prophet of the New Testament after Jesus, knowing that Jesus said, in, the Bible says in sundry, in sundry times, yeah. uh, God spoke through the prophets, but now he speaks through his son, Jesus. Yeah. What would be the difference between Old Testament and New Testament prophets? Bishop, I'm glad you asked that. That is one of the most confusing conundrums in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. I always go back to the concept of Elijah, Elisha. If you look at Elijah, he was the alpha prophet. He was known as the troubler of Israel. He did all the miracles. He killed the prophets of Balaam. And then oh, yeah. the transfer that came into Jordan. And then you see out of that comes Elisha. Now, Elisha to me is a type of the marketplace prophet because he was doing marketplace work before he got called into the ministry. Mm. So Elisha came in and of course, you know, he did the two miracles when he came across the Jordan and he, did about, he actually did 32 miracles altogether yes. through his whole tenure. Well, the spirit of Elijah was on him. And then the next time you see the spirit of Elijah, it's on John the Baptist. Now, Elisha and Elijah were both alpha prophets. They were the ones who did some torment against the enemies of God. John the Baptist, the spirit of Elijah on him, was not. He did not do that. He was the forerunner for Christ. Mm -hmm. The next time we see in the Jordan, we see the spirit of Elijah on Jesus. And I always go back to this component where Jesus met with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. And always wondering why that was done. And my thought was that Moses brought the law Elijah brought the prophet, handed that back to Jesus because when Jesus went down to hell, death, and the grave and destroyed the works of darkness, when he rose again, he gave gifts to all men, yes. apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor. Well, once it went through the cross, the prophetic ministry changed. We're no longer Old Testament prophets. We're now Wait, prophets. Are, We're no longer what? We're now? no longer Old Testament prophets. Mm -hmm. We're now a New Testament prophets. And here's the difference. There's four dynamics of prophet in the New Testament. Fivefold ministry, ministry of prophet, of, uh, sorry, office of prophet, ministry of prophet, uh, gift of prophecy, and um, the uh, Holy Spirit gifting of prophecy. Yes. So... It's, it's diverse. Now everybody can function. If you go back to the scriptures when Moses said, would it be that all God's children would prophesy? Yeah. We all have the capability, just on different levels. Because it's more in an articulate language yes. rather than in tongues. Yes. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's, there's four different dimensions. The problem is today, we have a lot of people with the gift of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy trying to prophesy major events which they don't have the capacity. Right. And when, they're not necessarily in the office of the no, prophet. No, That's a whole different calling. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I go back to Peter. When Peter, uh, <clears throat> when Jesus said, who do you say I am? And yeah. Peter gave that response to him. And, and then a little while later, Peter said, well, no, you're not going to Jerusalem to be destroyed. What actually happened is Jesus rebuked Satan in him. Why? It's because he opened up the door. He went beyond his measure of authority. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of the prophets today are, have gone beyond their measure of authority and speaking things that are not based from the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, that's my personal opinion, but I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the concern? Because my, my major concern is always I operate in the office and yeah. Yeah. in the spirit of prophecy as well. We know that... Uh, this ministry that Jesus has called us to is the spirit of prophecy. Yes. One thing that uh, I emphasize that I, there are a lot of prophets mm -hmm. 
that do not know their Bible. Yes. And therefore there is a imbalance yes. when they're trying to give some prophetic word, especially to an individual when it's not biblically sound at yeah. all. Yeah. And, uh, and how many people would say this is going to happen and it doesn't. Yeah. You, you remember in the Old Testament where the prophet received something, a, a message from God to go and do something. Yes. And an old prophet came along. Yes. Yeah and misdirected them. Yeah. What do you say about things that way that happened there, there? You see, what has happened too in, in, the, in the environment of the church today, prophecy has become more about emotion. Very true. And it's not about based in the truth of what the Spirit is saying. So it's more about influence and emotion, wanting to find influence and emotion with people, not wanting to deliver a message on truth. You know, you can have, basically the prophetic word is there to exhort, to uplift. Exactly. You know, you go back to Jeremiah's to root up, destroy, overthrow, and what it is to plant. And so we, we go back to this concept of prophetic words are there really to direct people, to give them wisdom and knowledge and and help them, what I would say, uh, help them evaluate where they stand. And mm -hmm. secondly, to build them up. You know, not to overthrow them, but to build them up. And a lot of guys step out of their measure into a witchcraft. And what, let, let me just quantify what I'm saying. No, no, that's a good point. Go ahead. When, do you, I don't know if you remember when, when um, Saul got a word from Samuel. Mm -hmm. And when Samuel passed away, Saul went to the witch of Endor and got the same word. You see, there's, you have to check the source. Is right, it the Holy right. Spirit or is it the flesh? Right, right. And, and this is where we have a, a conundrum. That's why most of the church sort of backs away from prophecy because they don't know how to discern whether it's the Spirit or not, you know? Yes. Yep. I was thinking of, uh, you said something in reference to the two. When we look at uh, in consideration of what and how God speaks His Word, the Bible is prophetic scripture. Yes, yeah. That that should be understood. So that means an individual yeah. can take that and begin to speak something yeah. in accordance to, to what they think yeah. or they interpret the scriptures as. Yeah. And that becomes another issue. Yes. Uh, and with that, uh, that imbalance there, you got people and, and Ron, I see it all the time, and I know you do, where you will say certain things and they think that they should go out there and do something. Yeah. And I mean, they will end their marriage, they mm -hmm. will walk away from a person. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and when you end your marriage for the sake of saying, oh, I got a prophetic word, yeah. you certainly don't understand yeah. the balance of the word. That's true. Well, the Bible says you need a righteous man who rightly divides the word of truth. Mm -hmm. You always have to balance the prophetic word that's spoken against the written word. Yes. Because God's not going to violate his written word. Exactly. He's going to balance it. So you always have to balance it. And I always tell people uh, when they get a prophetic word is to write it down. And this is what I encourage them to do. If you get a prophetic word, I do this with mine. If I get a prophetic word from someone, I write it down. Then what I do is I color code it. Mm. And when God says, I will do this, I color code that blue. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I pray the blue. I don't pray the outcome. Because when you pray the word, the outcome will take place itself automatically. Yeah. And so I pray the word, I keep, I remind God of the word continually, keep it before him, especially if I discerned and divided the truth that I know that that's a word from the Lord, then I do that. Yeah. You know, when I, when I, when I was, when I was prophesied over there, God's going to send me to America. And what you're you, from South Africa. Yes, South Africa. Okay. That when I was at, it was a very prophetic church I was at, and um, Kim Clement actually prophesied that mm -hmm. word over me. And I prayed, I wrote it down, I prayed, I said, God, if this is you, now going back to 1976, when I came here to celebrate the bicentennial, I had an encounter with the Lord even before I knew him. Mm -hmm. But when I came here in the 90s after the prophetic word, what I did is when I got that prophetic word, I divided it up and I prayed it. And within the space of a month, there was four or five different confirmations from different people that didn't hear the word, didn't know it. 
And then as we came and as we started to walk in the word, God opened the doors and made it available to us because we knew it was the right word. Mm. Sometimes when the word's not right, you'll try and make it happen yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then when I came to Texas, the guy gave me this saying, God is fixing to fix the fix you fixed yourself. <laughs> you know, sometimes we try and fix things for God so we can do it ourselves. But, and that's what he said. You need to watch out that you don't try and fix things to make the word come true so that God does come back and fix you after you've done the thing yeah. yourself, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's interesting because, of course, people think that when they get a, a, a particular yeah. word, they ought to go out there and do everything to make it happen. No. It doesn't work, work that way. You yeah. walk, you just live your yeah. life according to God's yeah. plan, and you'll walk right yeah. into that yeah. prophetic word. And, if, and then in most cases, you won't even remember. Yeah all of what is happening Except, yeah. at the time. That process yeah. can be grueling at it's, times. Yeah. It's like uh, a Joseph having a dream. dream. He didn't even remember the dream until his brother stood before him yeah. and bowed before him. Yeah. Because that that many years that he had to go through, you forget. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's how it is. Yeah. When you get a word, you just live your life. You give glory to God. You do everything that God wants you to do. You hear God. You're growing in yeah. knowledge and in wisdom. And then you'll find yourself walking right into that thing. You know, uh, the funny thing about that is when you start looking at the prophetic words and you start seeing contradictions where, where the word basically contradicts where you are and contradicts your life. The, what I say to people is they, they have the saying, well, if you don't believe it, put it on the shelf. <laughs> well, that's the first book of imaginations. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a word. Oh, oh. The bottom line is what I say to people is if you get a word and you believe it's a word from the Lord, you have to firstly believe it and receive it. Absolutely. And then in receiving it, rightly divide it. And then from rightly dividing it, then you have to start praying it into existence. Bring it for, before the Lord, continue. Because you're not going to manufacture that yourself. Exactly. Because th there's a separation between the natural and the spiritual. And with the word spiritual, it's going to take care of itself. If it's natural, well, it's not going to happen. You see? And and this is what we've seen. We've seen a lot of this over the years where guys have prophesied stuff that's been actually what I call bull honky. It's nonsense. It doesn't come to pass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of guys that do that because they just want the favor from people and they want to be recognized. You know, one of the things, Bishop, that I discovered when I was prophesied over that time when I first was told that I'm going to be a prophet, I didn't know what a prophet was. Right, right. Um, the pastor of the church called me and said, hey, listen, I want to see you Monday morning. Come to my office. I said, okay. I thought, well, I'm getting recognition for this beautiful opportunity now that's been <laughs> presented to me, even though I didn't know what it meant. Uh -huh. And um, so I got his office on Monday morning. He said, man, listen, I'm so glad that God's spoken to you. He said, I really need your help. I said, okay, I'm, I'm willing to help. What, you know, I'm a prophet, you know. Right. He said, now, when we do our... Sunday morning things. You see, we our, our church was in the movie theater, and so and this is where in, in Cape Town, yes, in okay, Cape Town. Town. Okay. And so we had to clean the movie theater on Sunday mornings for church to take place and set up all the stuff. And he said, "I really need you to help me on Sunday morning. I want you to clean the restrooms." Mm. And I said, "Hold on a second. You didn't hear the word of the Lord. I wasn't called to clean restrooms." He said, "Let me, let me just." <laughs> Let me just challenge you quickly. You can start your ministry in the restroom or you can end it there. You choose. And I said, all right, I'll clean the restrooms. <laughs> because here's the thing, Bishop. Humility and being humble is a great part of your trial and testing as a prophet. Praise God. You can't just come in out and just say, well, you know, you're the man because you're not. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to humble ourselves. And when I came to America and I, was on, I went on TV channel, a guy said one day, he said, you know, you need to wear shoulder pads in your jackets that make, make a better impression. Oh, you are kidding. Yeah, I said to him, why? <laughs> he said, oh, you make a bigger impression. I said, if that's what it's going to take, then I might as well go home. Because I'm not going to do that because I don't play those games. Uh -huh, uh -huh. If God has called me, 
then he'll take care of me. Yeah, absolutely. And these are the things we have to understand because you can have you can have a gifting, but your gifting is going to only be as strong as your character. Yes. You know, because if you look at the nine... Character is a, Yeah. Absolutely. If you look at the nine gifts of the spirit, you have nine fruit of the spirit to balance it. So that's, that. those things balance each other out. You can have all gifting, but if you do not have love, you have nothing. And there's so many components to this prophetic thing that we have to understand. You know, I don't... For interest sake, prophesy judgment over things because I realize that's probably not my position. And and I, I stay I try my best to stay in the on the component of love. And if God's gonna give me something to make a judgment about, I'm really gonna pray about it and find out if that's the Lord, because I believe that judgment's been reserved in Christ. Of course we we we, we talk about prophets and yeah. uh, I think the most important thing is understanding it, this is Jesus' ministry, yeah. uh, just like ministry of a pastor, apostle, and he wore all five. Yeah. We are in a position, I'm a pastor, I'm a, yeah. an apostle, I'm, uh, I'm literally walking practically in all five of those yeah. gifts like Paul did. And, uh, but understanding when God gives me a word to share, mm -hmm. Sometimes it can get in the way when you know the mentality of people mm -hmm. uh, because they are expecting something and it hinders yeah. that word from being received in its proper context. Yeah. Do you ever pick up on that as well when you find the immaturity of yeah. the person oh, that is saying, hey, I want you to prophesy so that I can, you know, leave and go and do what I want to do yeah. over in Timbuktu, you know, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of people um, would like to manipulate you to, to say what, and I, and I find this a lot when I'm prophesying of people and they start speaking in tongues. I stop them because I get the interpretation of the tongue. They don't want me to prophesy that to them. <laughs> And so, so they'll talk in tongues. Yeah. And you will get the interpretation of the tongue. Yes. And, and you, you know they don't want the, no. you to go ahead. And mostly they do it out of fear because they're afraid of being exposed or uncovered. Or they, they, they want something specific from God. Uh -huh. And so then that interrupts probably your flow. And the biggest thing is if they don't come in faith, there's no demand made on the anointing. Very true. And and that's the biggest problem I find with people. If they just stand there, tell me something good about myself. Well, I'm, you're wearing deodorant, that's good. <laughs> you know, what can I say? If there's no faith, because look, faith draws something out of you. Very true. You know, the widow woman would by faith took hold of the hem of the garden, which took virtue. Sometimes when people one a word, but there's no faith for for them, and there's fear and anxiety and worry. Yes. And there's no faith, and you, no matter what you prophesy, it won't go in. I can feel when somebody is receiving what I'm saying. I can feel when somebody's rebuffing it, as well, because right. you know you sense it. Because the Holy Spirit knows the ebbs and flows of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Like the sons of Issachar, you know the movements of of what the Holy Spirit's doing in the in the temple of the Lord, you know. And I'm finding that if people and I, this is kind of funny. If people have grown up in churches that are uh, cessation churches, where they don't believe in the gifts and they believe it passed away, those are the hardest people to convince and believe because the bottom line is they have no platform for belief and for value to understand that these gifts are for today. Very true. Because how's God going to mature the body if there's no gifts, if there's no Holy Spirit? What, we're going to do it by education? We've done a great job by education so far. And yes. look where we are. Mm -hmm. Look at the trouble we're in because of education. And I'm, I'm not against education. It's good to educate yourself. Mm -hmm. But also we need to understand that we need to be directed by the Holy Spirit. And if there's no position given to the Holy Spirit, we can't go anywhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah, there, there has to be a balance. You, you, when I see prophets... Uh, who so call themselves yeah. prophets because Jesus didn't walk around no. saying I'm a prophet. No. Paul didn't walk yeah. around saying I'm a prophet. Uh, he would declare and write uh, that I'm a, an apostle yeah. in the word, yeah. but he didn't emphasize that. No. That wasn't the emphasis of his ministry. Yeah. Uh, but today in America, how do you see America church so different than, than uh, perhaps in the way you grew up in South Africa? You know, firstly, I don't call myself a prophet, I call myself a messenger. 
but which is yeah. true. I didn't have any spiritual background when I got saved. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I, I, my mother was a Jew, my father was an atheist. We never had any spiritual input. So when I was, in, so your mother is Jewish, yeah. and your father is an atheist. Yeah. So, so what do you call yourself as a combination of the two? I just, I don't even know what to call myself. <laughs> <laughs> but when when God encountered me. And look, I wasn't looking for a guy. I didn't even know there was a God. When he encountered me and then dropped me on the floor and his kabad, his presence yeah. was on top of me. And I was, I saw my whole life flash in front of me. And what he said to me is when I saw that, he said, I forgive you. Praise God. And, and I was kind of shocked because I'd never heard that language before. Because I was always guilty of stuff, you know. Mm. I'd never been told that I'm forgiven. So, so my dynamic grew from that moment. Um, into seeing things. And my first real experience of seeing something is I went to a, a tent a revival in downtown Cape Town. And there was an evangelist that was doing this tent revival. I've never been in a place like that. People were whooping and hollering and going on. It was really crazy. But I sat right at the back because I was still battling with demon possession on that. Mm -hmm. And I was really kind of overwhelmed by the noise because of my PTSD. And I watched this guy walking on crutches and he only had one leg. And he had a box with him. And so the Wednesday night he came, he sat right there. The Thursday night he came, he sat right there. And the Friday night he came and during worship, something happened. This guy's leg exploded. Almost like, you know, those wow. animal balloons? And he screamed and yelped and he took, opened the box and took out his new pair of shoes and he put his shoes on and he started to run around and everywhere in, what happened? And I saw this first miracle where this guy had a leg grow and nobody prayed for him. The leg just grew just, out. Yeah, you like know, like that. those animal balloons of where they ex blow? Yeah. It just, boom, there it was. And he took, opened the box, put his shoes on, and he dropped his crutches and he ran around the place. And everyone was wondering, what happened? What happened? Even the evangelist, he wasn't aware of what happened. Wow. But this man's faith activated something in God. And that's the first time I ever saw anything. And from that moment, there was really this hunger inside of me to know the Lord that intimately. Yes. That, that I, could, I could see things happen. I could see miracles. I could feel those miracles. It wasn't even about the prophetic. So what right. we saw back there was we saw signs, wonders, and miracles. When I came, and, and listen, I had, I had a black man come to my house during the riots. His name was Moses Sikilele. Moses had a bicycle, and he had one of those mouth pianos and the book of Luke. Mm. And he asked me for a place to stay because they burnt his house down in the riots. So I let my lady put him down in the quarters that I had down there for my people to stay. And um, three days went by and my lady came and said to me, um, the man, I think he's dead. So I went down there and I looked at him, he was actually prostrate, laying face down on the floor with his hands up like this. And um, I was overwhelmed, I, I thought he died. And I, I was going to call the cops and say, well, I, I've got a dead Whoa. man here. Well, a little while later, he came and said, I'm so sorry, sir. I was laying before the Lord, waiting for him to speak to me. Three days, he lay on the floor. I said, well, what did he say? He said, I have to go to uh, Peter Marisburg. I have to go up the mountain. There's a church I need to start there. Now, I said, but you got a bicycle. That's going to take you two or three days. He said, yeah, that's fine. I said, no, let me take you with my truck. So I took him with my truck, and we went up this mountain um, on a goat trail. We uh -oh. drove up this mountain, and we stopped at this watering hole where these ladies were doing the washing. And there was a water fountain, and they were doing the washing, and he called them together, and they packed their washing, and they went away, and they went up the hill. And we turned this truck around, thinking, okay, we're done, we're going to go home. We were there Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And this man, people came out the mountains. He must have prayed over about 5,000 people. He cast demons out of him. Wow. Baptized them all, got them saved. And eventually the witch doctor came down, crawling on his belly like a snake. Wow. Cast the devil out of him. Got him to repent, baptized in water, sat down with a group of men that he chose as elders and taught them the book of Luke and told them to set up a church and build a church and he'll come back. And when we were driving down, I said to him, how come, how did this happen? I mean, how did you get this encounter? 
He said, when I was a young boy in Ulundi, I was a goat herder for my father. And men came by with an assegai and they stabbed me and they killed me. And he showed me the mark. Wow. Yeah, showed me the mark of, yeah. And he said... Um, he killed him. Somebody killed him, yes. And they put him in a box. In Africa, they buried them before the sunset because they don't want their spirits to roam. And they were busy walking him down to the place to go and bury him. And this white evangelist stopped and said, I want to talk to the man in the box. So they put the box down, they all ran away. And he raised him from the dead. And he gave him the book of Luke and he said, preach this message. Wow. And so... Wow. Uh, I said, wow. I thought, so I said, how many of these churches? He said, I have over 4,000 of these churches through the whole of Africa. And all he had is a Bible, the book of Luke, and like I said, a mouth piano. Let me ask you, do you see, because I believe in miracles. Yes. Uh, we have miracles that are not per se, like nationally recorded. Mm. They're happening here. Yeah. Do you see the move of God happening before the coming of the Lord, I mean in a dramatic and powerful way that will impact the church as much as the world, because yeah. the church, revival doesn't happen in the world. Revival has to happen yeah. with us. Do you see <clears throat> revival hitting in the body of Christ? Not just, we'll get to the marketplace mm -hmm. later real fast, but but in the church as far as miracles and people coming and being saved and coming off the streets and because that's what I saw growing up yeah. uh, when we got when I got saved. If the church can get out of the way and can repent and uh, let the Holy Spirit move mm. and allow him to move and not compete with each other, but work together because that's what we call to unity. That's why you have the apostles and prophets to bring unity yeah. to the faith. And um, if you can have the foundation of the church set in the apostles and prophets, like it says in Ephesians 2, that's the power base of the church. Most organizations have been established on the base of the pastor and an organization, uh, the upside down triangle. If you would allow the right government setting I think we'd have massive miracles, yes. Wow. But there needs to be a sort of a, a revival in governance first, in authority and leadership first. So you're saying the church is in the way. That's what you're saying. That's what it is, yes. Which I, I strongly believe. Yeah. So you're saying when the church is in the way, the leadership in the church, yeah. it's about money. And, yeah. And, and business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And so... And, and I'm not making a, a casting a judgment against no, it. I'm no, just no, saying no, that's I'm, this is an observation of what I see when I travel around. And the problem is there's so much unbelief. Guys don't believe in so much. True. There's such skepticism about the gifts. There's skepticism about everything. And what has happened is, and, and I'm going to say this, there's probably be people upset. Say it. <laughs> I think we have started to worship worship. Mm. Because... Good point. I mean, sometimes we have these demonstrations that of lights and sound and music and all, which is lovely. But well, how much? Of, worship. But how much of it? Yeah, how much of it is really worship? Right, right. You know, because those who worship Him will worship in spirit and truth. That's it. And um, you know, you can have a beautiful audience and you can have a beautiful sound and make lovely music, but how much are those people transformed when they walk out the door from the experience? Yeah. Because isn't that in our Jesus said to the Samaritan woman that um, the day will come when no longer will men worship on this mountain That's or that, right. but they will worship in spirit and truth. Now, if we could start worshiping in spirit and truth, the presence of God will fall on the place. And let me tell you, there will be change. Yeah. There will be transformation. Yeah. Things will happen. And it'll reach out. I have to tell you this. In Cape Town and South Africa, during the early days of Rodney Hart Brown. You know, we had them here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah go yeah. ahead. In, in our city in Durban, it was kind of amazing. Rodney had just left. And I mean, the people were still all over the place, stuck to the floors, stuck to the walls. And the, we had this graduation for the Bible college. And the speaker they had got up and said, stop the, tell the people, stop laughing. And the doors blew open and the spirit of the Lord went out into the streets and across the road from the church was the bus terminal for the 
African-American people to go back to their townships. Oh. And I went out in this thing and eventually there was so much ruckus outside that people called the police because they thought there was a riot. But these people in the buses were hit by the Holy Spirit and they were falling and they were wow. weeping and laughing and crying. And, and the police came and then the police were there and even the police dogs just sat there and the police themselves were falling in the spirit as well. <laughs> and the power of God moved. I mean, there was there were schools that closed down because the kids were baptized. And all there were women sitting in the hair salon under the dryer that passed, fainted under the spirit of God and went out. I mean, it was just all over the city. The power of God just... Yeah, but you know what? There was such a desperation in South Africa because we were expecting blood in the streets because of the violence and the hatred that the church got up and went and confronted the government about releasing Mandela. So that was, it was a reference to the yes. apartheid. Yes, it was breaking that spirit of the nation. Right. And the spirit of the Lord moved in the church. I mean, all the churches had revival. It was a powerful thing. So I saw that. And when I came to America, it started at first. And then what happens is people took it and tried to own it. You can't That's, own oh, what the Holy Spirit yes. does. No. You know? No. You, 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 that is one sad part. Everybody wants to put their name on it. Yeah. Rodney uh, Brown, uh, Howard Brown was here. And yeah. he was sharing with me. Uh, on his testimony yeah. uh, in South Africa and how when God started using him yeah. uh, and he had black people there and he just stood against that system. Yeah. Uh, but he was very adamant about uh, uh, the misconceptions yeah. as well. Yeah. But we had a very good talk and discussion about how God was doing things. And, and so I believe that we're in a time that it, it is a combination. Yeah. The political has to be hit mm -hmm. just as much as the marketplace, yeah. just as much as the religious places, so that way every part of yeah. this world yeah. and every single element and uh, a p position and structure <clears throat> is touched yeah. by the Holy Spirit yeah. before the coming of yeah. the Lord. And yeah. that's what I sense. Well, you know, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Yes. It doesn't belong to anybody. So it belongs to the Lord. That's right. But right now we know that it's dark. We know that times are dark. Uh, education, healthcare, everything is dark. There's, there doesn't seem to be any light. Yeah. But we know that out of darkness comes light. So prophetically, what I'm seeing for America, everybody's seeing calamity. I'm seeing God bringing this nation to its knees so we can repent. Oh, you're right. And this may not go across very well, but the bottom line is, I think when our, our leaders would stand up and repent, things would change. You know, I want to say something, Bishop, if I can. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the days when I consulted in Congress, I had a dream. And I wrote it down. It was The dream is called Sailing Ships and Hurricanes. And in this dream, I was... Uh, I was flying kind of thing behind these sailing ships that were coming from the Horn of Africa around that way through the seas through the middle passage to America and I would hear in this dream I would hear the sailors singing about the wealth they're going to make from these people and I would hear the crying and the moaning in these holes of the people and the blood that was left in the water because of the dead bodies that were thrown overboard Whoa. it was a spiritual dream and how in this component, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that if the nations that participated in the slavery would repent, they wouldn't face the hurricanes. Because where the hurricanes come from? They come from that whole, that whole bulge of Africa area. Whoa. And they come across the Sahara Desert into the Middle Passage. And every state in America that they hit or the states involved with slavery. Every nation that's around the Bahamas that gets hit was slavery. So all that, and you know what, they laughed at me. And I said to them prophetically, and I did this in front of Congress, I said, you will see the bodies floating in the street. And it wasn't even two, three months later, Katrina happened and the bodies were floating in the street. Wow. So all I'm saying is this, is if we would just repent. Yes. You know, if we would repent, because look, first the natural, then the spiritual. We, there's so many things going on <clears throat> in the natural. The way to change it is to deal with it in the spirit. We just 
trying to deal with things in the natural is not going right, to work. Right. You know, you can't. It's, the politics we know is not going to work. I tell you why. It's a coin. Exactly. There's two sides to a coin. One's got a head on, the one's got an image on it. But I say there's a third side to a coin, and that's the outside part, and that's God's part. <clears throat> Both sides of the coin, even though they say they're different, they're the same. Mm. They're the same coin. Yeah. <clears throat> so no matter whether we go left or right, we're dealing with the same thing. Yeah. We need yeah. to change. Wow. Well, we're going to have a powerful time. What can the people expect tonight? What? Well, uh, it, the time is limited, but we also want to take an opportunity on Thursday morning. <laughs> but what can people expect tonight uh, in brief? Well, I've been, I've been dealing a lot with what God's original intent for mankind was and how it was railroaded and shipwrecked by the fall of man. But how Christ, through his sacrifice, has reinstituted God's original intent for man. To rule, to take dominion, and have authority of all birds of the air, beasts of the field, and all things that creep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the creeps of the earth, right? <laughs> and so I, I, my thing is this, is we need to get back into our original place that we were designed to be. I believe that. We're a temple of the Holy Spirit. We carry the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and said, He will be with you and He'll be in you. He'll lead you and guide you into all truth. That's where we need to go. Yeah. So you believe in divine protection. I yes. believe in divine protection. Uh, Exodus 14, 14, Moses said, the Lord will fight for us. Yeah. I just believe that yeah. if we adhere to the Spirit of God, give in to Him. Yes. Repent. That's yeah. key. If my yeah. people which are called by my name, we yeah. know that. Uh, but just And just adhere. Don't get out of those private sins mm. yeah. that you do in the dark because that's, that's a hindrance. Yeah. Uh, too many of those things exist, yeah. and it, it, it sort of stifles the Holy Spirit from moving. Yeah. That creates a large sense of unbelief yeah. because they are dealing with uh, not only their, their, their secret sins, but their the shame as yeah. a result of it. Yeah. Tonight, yeah. we know that you can't lay hands on everybody in the whole world, but yeah. I know God's going to do something. <laughs> quickly yes we want people to come agree and so we encourage the people to come we want every single person thank you don't miss tonight, tonight. you don't want to miss it we look forward to seeing you we have prophet ron campbell he's out of dallas he's going to be sharing and uh, we're expecting a powerful extremely powerful word tonight god bless you we look forward to seeing you god bless you now god bless you